Hello and welcome to Stand in the Gap. I'm Sam Rohr and I'll be joined again today on this program as normal by Pastor Isaac Crockett. Last week we introduced a program, just invited you in uh, in a different way to a, a conversation that uh, Isaac and I had uh, where we were considering the concept as is America actually now a mission field in need of truth speaking missionaries? And the answer was we left it, yes we are. We also gave some counsel and advice on how you and me, I, could be actual the missionaries that God intends for this time. Now the fact of the matter is that in our nation, as you know, we are no longer a Christian nation. We are a mission field nation. We're a nation though that from our highest levels, and even from our own people in a general sense, have demonstrated they don't really need God. We may say on our coins, in God we trust, but do we really? Well, not by our actions. And we're a culture where the legislatures of the various states and Congress and the judiciary have said that killing babies is fine, and redefining father and mother to a hundred different variations is just fine. And that we don't need the Ten Commandments of God anymore on our walls of our schoolroom because, well, what is truth? We've actually become a corrupted culture. So how does one live godly in a corrupted culture? Can you and I live godly in a corrupted culture? Well, I want to encourage you that yes, we can, but it's not going to happen accidentally. It's by purpose and by choice. And there are two individuals that um, I think of biblically that uh, both were in very hostile cultures, hostile to the God of heaven and to the ways of God, and yet they stood strong. And uh, you would know them. We've sung songs about one of them. One of them was Daniel, and one before him was Joseph. Young men, tough spots that they were in. Boy, they really were. But they were successful for God in tough times. And we look back on them with admiration. And God says, like all of Scripture, the Scripture was given to us for our admonition and for encouragement. So on this program today, I want to lay out three steps for godly living in a corrupted culture. And I want you to think, along with me, with Daniel and Joseph as examples of individuals who did just that. And so get out your pens and write down some notes as we go through, and we hope these simple things will help you to be confident that yes, even in these days of corrupted culture in our nation, that you and I can live godly. Isaac, let me go to, go to you on this regard. We're going to not talk about Daniel and Joseph all the way through the program, but I think through the process we're going to demonstrate exactly why they, um, we recall them with fondness, and they are spoken very highly by God Himself in their lives. But uh, just out of curiosity for you, uh, were Daniel and Joseph, as an example, uh, a hero to you as a young boy growing up, or maybe even a man right now? Oh, yes, of course. And I think that they were kind of the, the top two from the Old Testament. And you know, when I was really young, of course, because the exciting stories. I mean, you know, being in a lion's den and, you know, standing before the king um, and, you know, fighting with your brothers and being thrown in a well and all, all these exciting, miraculous things really catch your attention. But then, you know, going in through, you know, middle school and high school, you find uh, this, the corruption you mentioned, you know, and, and bringing this in. They, they lived, whether it was a family that was corrupted or a whole country that for generations had been corrupted, going into an even more corrupt culture of Babylon. They were there, and when you're in you know, school and you're you know, invited to parties or you have this thing or that opportunity to try this or experiment with that, and you're looking for, has anybody else been through this? Well, you, those stories stand out in your mind, and it, it's not just the little kid liking these amazing stories. As a young person, it's saying, I can identify with the, the difficult place they were put and I want to be like Daniel. I want to be like mm. Joseph. And so that, you know, that's for me how it was. And I, I know that it must be for you because you're the one that picked the two of them as the examples. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it was that. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll tell you, I'll just share briefly here. Daniel and Joseph to me were my heroes 
when I was a very young boy, my mother told me when I was growing up, Sam, choose a hero from the Bible. Don't look to sports world, you may find one there. Don't look to the Hollywood, there may be one there, but they're really slim. Choose one from the Bible because that's why God put them there. And God led me to the lives of Daniel and Joseph. Why? Two young boys, Daniel maybe 12, Dan, uh, Joseph maybe 16, Daniel maybe 12, were in unusual circumstances, but they stood tall like a mature man of faith. And ultimately they both became men of faith and vice presidents of their respective nations. They actually served in public office. Isn't that amazing? And so God worked in my life by using them as an example. And I know no matter who you are or where you are, there were things about their lives that no doubt have touched you or could. When we come back, we're going to talk about those three godly steps or steps to living godly in a corrupted culture, as did those two young men. Truth, flexible or permanent? The Bible, ancient history or powerfully relevant? Culture, a reflection of enlightenment or warning signs? The pastor, commentator or frontline combatant? Every day, American Pastors Network speaks to these questions where and when they matter with hundreds of affiliate radio stations nationwide. A website and mobile app screening today's headlines through the twin lenses of the Bible and the Constitution. Educating, informing, equipping. This is the American Pastors Network. The time is now to stand in the gap for truth. Welcome back to the program, and as we introduce the program for today, Sam said that we're going to be talking about how we live a godly life in a corrupt culture. In fact, three steps to living a godly life in a corrupt culture, just like Daniel and Joseph. And, uh, you know, Sam, you have been much like your hero, Daniel. Your mom told you to pick a hero. Daniel and Joseph became your heroes. And, and that you have learned to stand for truth. In fact, the name of our program is Stand in the Gap. And uh, you have been involved much of your life in political office, and you had to be, you had Daniel moments. You've talked about it on TV and radio and elsewhere where you had to take a stand. And so when you talk about living like Daniel or Joseph in these corrupt cultures that mirror the culture we're living in in America today, uh, you, you've come up with three steps. And those steps are pray, witness, and resist evil. So let's just get into these. Um, you know, people say all the time, even on social media, people who haven't darkened the door of a church in years and don't seem at all to be living a Christian life. Something bad happens. It's a diagnosis of COVID for one of their loved ones or something. And the first thing they do is, oh, please pray for me. Or people say, oh, I'll, I'll pray for you. And we, we innately know as a nation that we need to pray. But why? Why is it so important that we pray? Um, Isaac, I think it's important to pray. And these are three things... Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that, that have come to my mind, that I write, so maybe you can write these down, um, is that God commands prayer. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 says, pray without ceasing. Okay, there's a reason for that. Luke 18, 1 says, men ought always to pray and not to faint. That means it takes some work. It takes some effort to pray, doesn't it, Isaac? You know, and then, but then secondly, there is power in prayer. I think of an example of uh, Joshua of old who was engaged in a battle and he prayed and God actually had the sun stand still. <laughs> what an amazing thing. There is power. God doesn't always do that, right? But he, but he can. And then, uh, and then Isaac, the other thing is it's, it's essential armor. Ephesians 6 talks to us about the fact to put on the whole armor of God and then it talks about the breastplate and the sword and so forth. But it concludes that whole passage by saying and talking about praying always because that's what undergirds it. So it is, it is an essential um, element for us uh, to pray. The reason is that if we understand the battle and I, say, I want to go back to you at this point. If we understand the battle, we are not fighting against flesh and blood. 
but we're fighting against spiritual wickedness in high places. And how, how can we compete in that spiritual realm without the work of the Holy Spirit? Hmm. And how do we get access to it without praying? Hmm. So those are, those are the three things of the why hmm. that I would lay down. God commands it. There is power in prayer, but it's also prayer is an essential part of the spiritual armor if we are in fact going to engage successfully spiritual warfare and if we don't understand that we're going to fail right from, the, right from the beginning but prayer is where you put that together that's the why part exactly so now let's go into how because everybody tries to pray everybody wants to pray everybody <laughs> talks about prayer but not everybody's effective at prayer how how do we pray biblically you know and the the, the disciples had that same question then they go to jesus and they said lord teach us to pray Mm -hmm. And that's when he gave the model prayer. But this is one aspect that I, to me has really meant a great deal. If you have your, jot it down, ladies and gentlemen, this, this uh, verse, Psalm 66, 18. There the, uh, David says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So powerful prayer starts with having unconfessed sin holy hands. If we go to God and we have bitterness in our hearts, we have maybe a family member that we won't talk to because we're bitter at them, or we have some neighbor we have a problem with that we won't resolve, then God's not even going to hear our prayer. Not that He won't even answer it, He says He won't even hear it. So that's the first one, uh, clean heart. Second, the uh, Lord tells His disciples, we have to have faith believing. We have to, if we pray with faith meaning that we believe God can answer, and believing even a small amount of that, we can even move the mountains, right? Like a mustard seed. So that's second. Pray with a clean heart, and then pray with faith believing. And then James 4 talks to us about praying with pure motives. In other words, if we come to God with the intent that we have a selfish motive, we are praying so that maybe we get the glory for it, or that we can be seen like a Pharisee, then God says, I'm not going to answer because you've got a selfish prayer. And then the last one is that we must pray according to God's will. Isaac, if Jesus himself in the Garden of Eden, not in the Garden of Eden, but, but in the Garden, Mount of Olives, before he went to the cross, prayed to his Father and said, Lord, if it could be, make this cup pass for me, but nevertheless, thy will be done. I think Isaac, things would change if we pray in accordance with God's will rather than seeking and asking God to answer our prayers according to our will. Mm. Those are very powerful points uh, about prayer. So you say the three steps, pray, witness, and resist evil. So witness, uh, you know, where do we witness? Uh, you know, do we just stand up in our living room and say, you know, I testify of this? Or where do we do this? Well, you know, we, we, we start in our own hearts and minds. Mm. Uh, it, it's really a decision. That goes back to the, the program we did last week about uh, America, a mission field. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We think evangelism is witnessing uh, only to the person in Africa or some other part of the world. No, no, it's really not. Witness is a witnessing of the truth. Mm. But it starts with, as we say, we've got to define the truth. Mm. Well, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So to give a godly witness, to live in a godly life in a time of corrupted culture, we have to define the truth. This mm -hmm. world has redefined the truth into whatever man thinks it is. But God says truth is Jesus Christ. So to witness means we have to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ first. We have to know the truth before we can ever witness to the truth or of the truth. So that's a, the starting point. And then how do we go into it? And, and especially if you could flesh it out for what that looks like here in modern day America, what witnessing looks like then? How, how do we go about it? Well, first I think of 1 Peter 3.15. It's a command that says, be ready always to give an answer for, of the reason of the hope that is within you. Now that's a witness. Yeah. Now that means to the lost, but that also means to the other person who's a Christian that we may need to sharpen and come alongside and help equip them. So it's a decision to say, I must be ready. And of course, you can never be ready for anything unless you prepare. So if I don't read my Bible and I don't pray, which we just talked about, I, how am I going to be equipped 
to witness to the truth of Jesus Christ about a person if I do not even know who Jesus Christ is or have not taken the time to study and memorize the Word of God, which is the truth. So it, it, it starts with that decision, first of all. I have a duty, I have a need, and I'm going to do what's necessary to do it. It starts there. So, so these all, they build upon each other. Each point builds, and again, looking at you know Daniel and Joseph, how they did it, and every godly person in the Bible. But I think some listeners might, or viewers might say, well, what about that last point, resisting evil? How does praying and being prepared, you know, the power of prayer, I see how that leads to then testifying, to standing for the truth in a way to, to witness but what do you mean by resist evil? Isaac, I think that comes from a f more full understanding of witnessing for the truth. Hmm. You know, and this, I'll, go, I'll go into it. Throughout Scripture, the Scripture talks about um, developing a fear of God. The book of Proverbs is all about wisdom. And it talks about fearing God. It talks about pursuing truth. Mm -hmm. But then the scripture is all about obedience. So it's pursuing truth, but then it's also the embracing of the truth. Uh, to say one thing, but never to do it, is an indication that you ever didn't know it, or you certainly not doing it. But then, no, seeking the truth, and then choosing to embrace the truth, which has within it, I choose to obey the truth. And those are two different things. Otherwise, we're a hypocrite, and we get accused of a lot of people. <laughs> they bring it upon them. I mean, I think of the life of Joshua, and he stood up at that time in Israel, and he said, listen, as for me and my family, you, you choose what you're going to do. He said, but as, as for me and my family, hmm. we're going to follow the Lord. If a person does not ever have a time in their life where they made that purposeful choice, they're probably, they're not living it. Mm. So we've got to choose that for me and my house, my thinking, my heart, my actions, and as far as I have influenced my family, we will serve and obey the Lord. Now, at that point, a person is ready to stand in the gap for truth mm. because he's now made those necessary steps. And then when a person is willing to then say, well, I know the truth, I have chosen the truth, I have become public about the fact, I'm not hiding it, then that person is a good candidate for standing in the gap for truth, and that takes us to the next step of resisting the evil. Hmm. So you're saying that in order to stand, we have to spend a lot of time on our knees and, and at our desk, so to speak, pr you know, reading so we can pray for the Lord to help and guide us. We read so that we can witness, because we can only witness and testify of what we know, and then when we know it, we have to do what's right. We have to, those Daniel moments. And what, what is that? What does that look like uh, resisting evil in a way that is godly? Not just, you know, resist everything or anarchy, but what do we do specifically in resisting evil that changes things? That comes back also, Isaac, to understanding what the Scripture says. The Bible tells us that, that, that the devil is out there like a roaring lion going mm. about seeking whom he may devour. And God gives two basic principles. One, we run from evil. Hmm. We have legs. If we, if we sit in the presence of evil, don't expect God to help you get out of it. Mm -hmm. Get out of it. Like don't, sit, <laughs> don't sit in the seat of the scornful. Mm -hmm. Don't sit and watch that rotten stuff on TV mm -hmm. or the internet. Don't sit and participate in sin and then come back and expect God to help you to be successful. Hmm. No, we run from evil but we resist the devil, hmm. and he will flee from us. So the evil that is about us, under the control of the devil, must be resisted. We resist it by knowing the truth and applying the truth. Uh, Jesus did it in one example when the devil tempted him on the, before the transfiguration, and Jesus quoted Scripture, and he said, Get behind me, Satan. There is power in the resisting of evil by knowing the truth, running from it, the evil in some cases, and others opening our mouth and saying, I will not, or the scripture to the devil himself, get behind me, Satan. The other is this, is it's, 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 in, it's in the book of um, uh, Psalms, where it, ta it talks about this, that, that a decision to obey God will mean that we contend with the evil. Hmm. Contend with the evil means that we push back. Mm -hmm. That's resisting. 
so that when we encounter sin and evil in a corrupted culture, it could be a law, it could be a dictate, it, it could be some cultural norm. If we don't take and apply biblical truth to it and say, no, this is what God says about abortion, this is what God says about the family and the father. If we don't take and put the truth out there, this is God's standard, then we're not resisting. So we have to choose in our mind, we have to know the truth, we take and apply it, and believe me, the opportunities are coming fast and furious. We won't have a lack of opportunities to let uphold the truth. But when we do that, then we are actually resisting. And the Scripture talks a whole lot more in official ways, which we don't have time to get into right now. But that would be a basic way that all of us can and should. And this understanding, if we do not resist evil, the Lord says that we actually are participants in it. It's either or. It's, that's critical. You can't just watch it. You're either part of it or you're resisting it. And so, you know, there you have it. Uh, what a reminder, these steps to living a godly life in a corrupt culture, because we hear it over and over and over again about how corrupt our culture has become, but we need to be salt and light in that culture. So we're going to take a, another brief time out and we're going to come back and conclude with our thoughts about uh, living in a corrupt culture. Stand in the Gap is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. When we started the program today, uh, we put out the theme, uh, three steps to godly living in a corrupted culture. And we did this in the context that America has really become a mission field. It really is. Um, and we know we have a corrupted culture. Well, I pray that your desire is to live godly. And we threw out the two names of Daniel and Joseph, two young boys. Uh, they happened to be heroes of Isaac, and they were my heroes too. When I were growing up, and chances are um, they've played a factor in your life. But when I consider what they did, they did exactly what we laid. Now, I'll rehearse these three points. They knew how to pray. Daniel was a man of prayer. Was he not? We talk about that. Joseph was a man of prayer. You cannot be a godly person without being a person of prayer. And they knew how to pray. So we went through that. We, we pray because God commanded it. We pray because there's power there. We pray because it's an essential part of the armor of God if we're going to be successful in the spiritual battle. Uh, the disciples said, teach us to pray. We have to pray with a clean heart. We have to pray with faith, believing. We have to pray with pure motives. And we have to pray uh, in accordance to God's will. But we have to witness to the truth. But we have to know the truth, Jesus Christ. We have to decide to stand in the gap for truth if we do, and we move forward. And when we do that, then we have to open our mouth. Don't just sit there and participate in the evil. Run from it. Don't allow it just to go on. We raise our voice. That's what it means to be salt and light. Do your neighbors know that you're a Christian? If they don't, can I suggest you're not being very much salt? Maybe you've not decided to actually stand the for truth. How do we stand for truth? Well, we decide that we're going to because God says to. And then we say God's Word is our authority and I'm going to read it and study it, memorize it. And I'm going to look, as Peter says, for every opportunity we can to open our mouth and to give an indication of the hope that is within us. That's a, that's a witness. And when we do that, we actually stand in the gap for truth. But I think of Daniel and Joe. Let's go back to them. They prayed. Did they not witness for the truth? They both did. Matter of fact, Shadrach, she, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel's friends, went into the fiery furnace and God preserved them. Daniel went to the lion's den. God preserved him. But there will come a time when in our witness we're going to have to say no to sin. That was the decision that they made. Even Joseph himself when he said no to the temptation of adultery. And they all ended up in prison or they all ended up somewhere else. But God was with them, and they stood, they resisted, and 
what happened? We reflect upon them. God brought glory to His name through it. And as far as we know, those two young men made it to their death as politicians in office. No recorded moral failure. So can you live godly in a corrupted culture? Yes, you can. And I hope that you will. Hopefully this program was of help to you. Contact us this week. Let us know that you are listening and praying for us. And we will pray for you this week. God bless you.